Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 127 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. This is a bonus episode for the holiday season. I'm sharing with you an episode from the Gunfighter Project podcast where I was interviewed as the guest. We discussed several very interesting stories of espionage and spycraft, just as you've come to expect from me. The Gunfighter Project podcast is all about conversations with professionals from around the world to help you prepare and protect yourself and your family in everyday situations. It features interviews with former members of some of the world's most elite military units and has more than 30 episodes available now for you to dive into. You can find it on Apple Podcasts and many other platforms as well. So without further ado, here's my conversation on the Gunfighter Project podcast. Today on the show, we have one of my favorite Instagram pages personally, Spycraft101 or Justin Black. Uh, this is a bit of a different episode. So we obviously discuss uh, Justin's origins, where he kind of came from very, very briefly and how he got the motivation to start up Spycraft 101. Spycraft is an Instagram page that focuses on the world of espionage and like in the name, Spycraft. Uh, we cover four very different, hectic, uh, spy, espionage sort of stories and it sounds fake, but trust me, it is real. Uh, Justin has a wealth of knowledge. He does his research extensively on all of these different cases. He has over 500 stories on his Instagram page. And I was amazed by the sort of stuff that you hear that goes on in the shadows, the stuff that goes on around the world. It's easy to forget that this sort of thing happens in real time. So this is a really cool episode. I hope you enjoy this. Uh, I'm hoping to get Justin back on the show in the future to discuss more crazy spy stories. So Without further ado, Justin Black. Justin, how are you going, man? Hey, hey, good to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, very exciting to have you on. I've been a massive fan of your Instagram page uh, for a long time. So um, it's, a, it's a bit of a different one. It's probably one of a kind, I'd say, from what I've seen on Instagram. What kind of motivated you to start the page and talk about this sort of stuff? Well, I started it back in May of 2020, and I think a lot of us had a lot of free time around May of 2020, if you yeah. recall. And it was a project that I'd kind of been kicking around in one form or another for at least four years before that, as a matter of fact, without really you know, having the time to devote to it. So I finally decided to go for it after I'd gotten everything else done around the house that I could and had nothing to fill my days. And uh, I have really been drawn to this world for many, many years. And I got my degrees in history and, you know, I spent some time in military intelligence many years ago, so I had a little bit of a background, but really just an abiding interest in the, the history of this sort of thing more than anything else. And so I started this Instagram account about three and a half years ago now. And at the time, I only had about 20 stories, like a list of 20 stories. And I was like, I'll find some more after that. And it's turned into, I, I don't even have a count, only 500 plus I would yeah. say at this point, but I, I started with a very small handful and just kept looking, kept looking, kept, you know, digging and digging and, you know, found a lot more just things that I had, you know, heard of, you know, or rumored and that sort of thing and kind of dug into it all and uh, was really able to bring a lot of espionage history to people in a way that they had not seen it before. And I just kind of fell into an underserved niche there on social media. I think because all of this information is out there, it's all open source stuff, but you know, how many people are reading a book now that was published in 1968 and not since then, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm willing to crack open a dusty book and then put it where the people are, which, and, and they've responded really well, you know, people really love this kind of stories and I'm still finding more all the time. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's kind of along with those, you know, like the spy movies and stuff like that, that are always real popular. It's kind of, that world that not many people really get exposed to and you're you're doing it and this little i guess the template that you're utilizing by 
posting, you know, whatever Instagram allows you to 10 photos or videos, and then a story about that case, it's, you know, it gives people, it satisfies that need to kind of get things done in 10 minutes or whatever people feel nowadays. So I think it's a really cool niche and um, sort of thing that you've started up. Yeah, I've been really, really happy with how it's turned out so far. And, you know, Instagram is obviously a photo and video centric platform in a way that like a blog or a YouTube channel or something is not. And in a way, I kind of shot myself self in the foot by starting there because how many spy operations in the world they were taking photos that later yeah. were distributed throughout you know not that many right yeah so exactly it's constantly a struggle to find that that video clip or that photo but then i can fill the caption with all the details that are you know in quite a few places and because of that caption limit i've got to keep it down to around 350 words so uh that's a real challenge sometimes to edit these stories into a really clear and concise kind of way but it really whets people's appetite for more as well which i've i've really you know enjoyed seeing yeah for sure and it's a like it's a thing that goes on and it's been going on for a long time this sort of espionage sort of world that people don't really know about and i think um for me when you start talking i love the cold war sort of era but i also love kind of the current stuff because it's like people don't realize that this stuff is happening still currently in the last 10 years there's still stuff going on and i think that's what really gets people interested because they have no idea that this stuff actually happens yeah yeah it's really amazing what's going on and the only thing that i don't like i don't really post a lot of current events because what i found is that you know breaking news type stories they almost never have the full picture and they often have completely the wrong picture right yeah. it'll be based on a like a government press release more than anything else so there are these there's so many things going on you know russian executives that fall out of windows you know that's happened within the past couple of months and i know that 10 years from now we'll have a much better picture of what actually happened there but right now i don't necessarily trust that we're getting the complete picture of all of that but uh yeah absolutely everything that i post about everything that i talk about all of that is happening in spades all around us every single day without doubt yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so for the people that uh, are listening to this, thank you very much for joining us. We've got a bit of a different format to today's, uh, I wouldn't even really call it an interview. It's more of a discussion. Uh, we're going to go through, me and Justin have spoken offline about four uh, really interesting cases and stories that he's talked about on his page. And we're going to kind of talk about them uh, a little bit more in depth than the 350 words you see on Instagram um, and provide a bit of an insight into these stories. So Justin, are you happy to get started? Yeah, absolutely. Let's do awesome. it. Awesome. So let's start with story number one. So this is, uh, and I'll read the first little paragraph and then uh, Justin, I'll just let you take it away, man. So um, an Indo Indonesian woman named Siti Aisha, apologies if I've gotten that wrong, films herself with James, a TV producer who has hired her to act in a Japanese comedy program, she is unaware that James is in reality a North Korean reconnaissance bureau agent and that she is being groomed for an assassination mission that will shock the world. All right, let's talk about this one, Justin. Sure, sure. So this is certainly one of the wildest stories that I've ever come across. And there's no way I would have believed it, honestly, if there wasn't so much ample evidence that it occurred, because it sounds way too fantastical to be real life. Yeah. And I even I have to imagine this is a, a North Korean operation here, and it's hard for me to imagine this this getting off the drawing board because when you hear what actually happened, it doesn't sound like it could possibly work. It totally stretches the bounds of imagination. And like, why wasn't it shot down a dozen times over? You know, as it went up the levels of approval in whatever the North Korean chain of command is. But not only did they decide to do this, but it completely worked in the way that they wanted it to. So, yeah. uh. Kim Jong Un is obviously the current, you know, dictator of uh, the most recent member of the Kim dynasty who's in charge of North Korea and he has a number of family members including his uh half brother named Kim Jong Nam and there was some because it's a familial dynasty, you know, somebody else can ascend the throne who has a blood relative, right? So there was a lot of question as to whether this Kim Jong Nam might eventually take the throne in North Korea rather than Kim Jong Un who as we know now did well kim jong-nam he was for his bloodline you know he was a potential candidate but he was really not a great choice in a lot of ways he didn't have a lot of uh leadership abilities i don't think and he embarrassed the family in a big way uh, a number of years before all of this went down because he traveled to japan in an effort to go to disneyland tokyo 
<laughs> and he got caught and arrested there. It just just an embarrassing little debacle showing this guy, you know, why would a potential, you know, leader of North Korea get caught trying to go to Disneyland in Tokyo? So just that kind of took him out of the running along with some other stuff. And he ended up essentially in exile living outside of North Korea. He was living up life. I think he had houses in a couple of different places, but he spent a lot of time in Macau, you know, which is like a a uh, gambling center, you know, uh, a little bit like Hong Kong. It's a semi-independent uh, area in China. So he was living up the good life with his family in Macau and traveling around the world a little bit. And he wound up becoming a source for not just the Central Intelligence Agency for the U.S. government, but also for the Chinese government, the Ministry of State Security, and probably some others as well. Because they would help him kind of fund the lifestyle that he wanted. You know, they give some big payouts and he gives some insight into, you know, the highest levels of North Korean society and governance and thinking and all of that. So he definitely had, according to, you know, recently published books, he definitely had like a Korean American CIA handler that he was meeting with pretty frequently in Macau. Uh, I don't know how much money he was getting, but he was living the high life and he was selling to at least one other intelligence agency as well. So kind of playing everybody off of each other. And um, in a way, just by living like he was, he was really spitting in the eye of his half-brother, and that's not going to go on for long. <clears throat> so eventually, they they tried several times to get him with more standard, like um, reconnaissance bureau assassins tried to get him in China, and those guys got caught by the Chinese government. And I don't think they were killed or jailed. I think that they were sent back you know, to kind of keep relations clean, but they tried some fairly standard assassination attempts against him that didn't work out, so they went with something – Completely different, completely out of left field, and I have to admit that nobody saw this one coming. Yeah, for sure. And so, when you talk, yes. sorry to stop you. When you talk about these uh, more, I guess, standard, basic um, assassination attempts, what sort of things were they attempting? I don't know a whole lot because really we don't get a whole lot of information out of China or out of North Korea. There's just been a couple of like press stories that I've seen that some North Korean operatives were arrested in China. But the details don't come out because why would they share with the Western press? You know, yeah, and why true. would North Korea share as well? So the best single source that I found is a book called The Rebel in the Kingdom by Bradley Hope. Uh, I interviewed him on on the podcast a few months ago and read the book, and it's terrific. And it goes into a lot of detail about this particular story as well as several others as okay. well. Okay. Yep. Sweet. All right. Carry on, man. Sure. So uh, the reconnaissance bureau is kind of like the the tier one guys of North Korea, from what I understand. They're the healthiest, fit, most physically fit, best armed, best trained, everything, and very zealous as well. And these are some of the few guys that are kind of um, trusted to go overseas and not defect or not remain in place over there. So they sent a guy who went by the name James, uh, as well as I'm sure he had some supporting team members. He went and found a couple of young ladies in Southeast Asia, one Indonesian, one Vietnamese woman, and he passed himself off as a reality TV producer, and he wanted them to take part in a TV show where they would do these public pranks, and that's a pretty common genre of reality TV, and I guess these young ladies, you know, so they saw a, a shot at glory, you know, a chance to be on TV, which not many people get, and they said, sure. So everything initially was going fine. Uh, James basically tells them they're going to play pranks on people in public places. They're going to smear their faces with a liquid, and then they're going to run away on camera, like a, a pie in the face kind of prank. And they pull it off several times in several different places. There's some video of them in the uh, in the international airport in Hanoi. They go after a Vietnamese government official, and James kind of selects the target, and he says, okay, the camera crew is hidden. Uh, they'll be filming you the whole time, so when I point this guy out, I want you to run up to him. I want you to smear his face with this hand cream, like a, you know, like a shaving cream kind of thing. And then run away and we'll film it and we'll, you know, broadcast it on TV later on for big laughs. So they did that. And there's some footage of them doing this in Vietnam. But really, James was just prepping them for this assassination attempt. And they were completely unwitting. They had no idea who the next target would be. They didn't know that they were working for the North Koreans. They didn't know where the money was coming from, because all of this makes perfect sense when you're just a kind of a naive young person who wants a chance to be on TV, because this kind of thing really does happen. So ultimately, <clears throat> their final target is... Kim Jong-nam, Kim Jong-un's half-brother. And they go after him in early 2017, and they don't know who he is. He's just a man who was pointed out to them in the airport. And they have no idea, but that, at that time, there's an entire team of uh, these reconnaissance bureau agents who are kind of posted around the airport. And eventually, these guys are picked up on the CCTV images, but they're long gone by the time that they're identified on camera. Uh, there's also a chemist who flies in who brings the actual 
weapon that they're going to be using, and there's James, the team leader. So the young ladies are in um, Malaysia for this hit, and the important thing about Malaysia is that it is one of the only places in the world that North Koreans can fly without a visa. So the whole team is able to get in with relatively little scrutiny, uh, the fact that it's like eight North Koreans flying in at once. So they come in, the young ladies come in, I guess their travel expenses are paid by James because they've been traveling all over Southeast Asia this whole time. And he points out who they're supposed to go after. And there's <clears throat> CCTV footage now of Kim Jong-nam. He's walking through the airport. He's temporarily by himself. And these two young ladies run up. And each one of them this time, they don't have like a shaving cream in their hand. This time, James sprayed like an oily kind of substance on their hands. So it's different than before, but basically the same concept. So they don't think much of it. Uh, the young ladies, they don't know it, but each one of them got a separate compound from uh, VX nerve gas. So when you put them together, it becomes deadly. But separately, it's okay. It's on their skin. It's not hurting them. If they were to shake hands with each other after that, they would kill each other. But they don't, of course. So they run up to Kim Jong-nam one after the other. They come up behind him on the CCTV footage, and they both smear their hands across his face and run away. So the VX compounds, they combine right there on his lips and under his nose – he breathes it in. He's got it on. He probably licked his lips or something like that. I don't know. But he ingests VX nerve gas right there in this crowded place. And the girls run away because they can see how mad he is and the skit's over with, right? So they're just going to meet up with James a few minutes later. And Kim Jong Nam, now he doesn't know what happened, but he knows something is very wrong because he knows he's on his brother's kill list. So he starts to panic immediately. And he's correct to do so because something terrible just happened. Uh, he runs up to security and he tells them something just happened and they start to take him to a nurse's station. He's kind of walking, you know, this long walk down a hallway to an emergency center. And he starts to get the shakes within just a couple of minutes of ingesting that VX. And he collapses while he's inside the nurse's station and they call an ambulance for him and put him in an ambulance and he dies inside the ambulance about 15 minutes after the attack. Uh, that's all it took. Only one casualty, even though they deployed a nerve agent in a crowded airport he's the only one who's hurt because of how cleverly they they did this the girls run away they have no idea what they did um all of the commando team they get out perfectly safely they aren't found until a long time later but the girls are identified in the aftermath of this and both of them are arrested and they are just completely beyond shocked at what happened they had no idea at all that they had just killed a man because they had done this three or four or five times before so they're put on trial they're totally horrified and it's a very hard story for anyone to believe because, I mean, listen to it. It sounds so insane, right? But this is really what happened. So the girls spend, I want to say it's almost a year or so between uh, pretrial confinement and then go on to trial and all that. And eventually uh, the charges are dropped entirely for one of the girls. And the other girl, I think, is just sentenced on lesser charges, like to 60 days in jail after that. And she's released like in 2018. So they've both been out of jail for a long time, but they had an unbelievable brush with destiny right there, becoming these unwitting pawns for the North Korean government in killing Kim Jong-un's half-brother. Yeah, for so, sure. And it almost burns uh, their go Like, it burns their guys being on CCTV, doing all this sort of stuff. Um, so did did the Malaysian authorities conduct, like, investigations and that how that's how all this stuff kind of came out? Yeah, there was an enormous investigation after that. And, you know, they had worldwide press attention, of course, because he was a known guy. Certainly. And the girls spoke very openly about everything. They didn't really have anything to hide. They didn't know to hide. You know, they weren't trying to protect anyone else. They were just trying to save themselves at that point. So a lot of stuff came out. There's been a lot of media articles written about all of it. But, you know, I have to question, certainly those guys' faces were seen. Um, I've got the video on my page of James himself, because one of them kind of turned their smartphone on him for a second there. But you know, what does it matter if we've seen his face? Because he's going to have a different passport. Uh, yeah. He might have been selected knowing that this will be the last time he leaves North Korea on this type of mission in case he gets burned. I mean, he certainly did his job in exactly the way that they wanted him to. So you know, sure. if anything, he might have gotten a promotion out of it or an early retirement or something, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, that's uh, it, it's a good way to start this, start this episode, that's for sure. Yeah, it's it's really hard to believe, but it all happened. It's all there on video, and it's been covered extensively, and it still makes me shake my head that something that audacious could actually work, but it did. Yeah, for sure. And it's the fact that it's all caught on, uh, like caught on CCTV, and 
it's just it's fucking unreal that um I know. that this sort of stuff happens in the real world. So if you are looking for this story, uh, it'll be linked in the podcast uh, description. Um, but also if you're going through Spycraft One Zero One on Instagram, you'll see like a really tall kind of skyscraper. Um, and if you swipe through it, you'll see CCTV footage and the picture of the two women and stuff like that. So, um, all right, sweet, Justin, are you ready to move on to the next one? Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. All right, so the next one is, I'll read the first paragraph. A recently surfaced photo appears to show Korean-American activist Adrian Hong as an extra in the 2012 film The Dark Knight Rises. Adrian will go on to lead a daring self-funded mission into the North Korean embassy in Madrid in 2019. We're starting to take a little bit of a North Korean uh, direction on this episode, but um, all right. So this one's crazy because it's in like, this dude is in the dark Knight rises, the Batman film. Um, That's in itself is uh, a crazy story, but um, all right, sweet. Justin, take it away on this one. Sure. So this story is actually kind of tangentially related to the last one. And um, there's a really fascinating connection there as well. But there is a young man, he's probably in his late 30s, I guess now, named Adrian Hong. Um, He grew up in America. He's of Korean descent. Uh, He's actually not even an American citizen, though, because he was born in Mexico. Uh, His parents were Christian missionaries in Mexico when he was born. So he never got his U.S. citizenship. He was just a permanent resident for many years, but he's, you know, fully Americanized. He lived all but, you know, like the first two years of his life in the United States. So Adrian Hong was a uh, college student about 20 years ago. And as you can imagine, a lot of college students, they tend to find um, causes to support. Uh, That's, I would say that's a phase for a lot of people, but it turned out not at all to be a phase for Adrian because he read a book about the hardships in North Korea in the detention camps where hundreds of thousands of people are wasting away, you know, they're starving to death, they're being worked to death, that kind of thing. He read a book by one of these survivors, one of the escapees of one of these camps, and it really opened his eyes to what was happening to people that he was directly, you know, ethnically related to and who lived right across a narrow border from his homeland. And so he decided he was going to do something about it. And this is over 20 years ago, and he never stopped doing something about it since then. Just an incredibly driven, uh, incredibly courageous guy, honestly. So throughout this story, Adrian's going to break a lot of the laws, honestly, but I'm still team Adrian. Honestly, after all of this, it's such an amazing story. So uh, Adrian started by um, just doing some fundraising and creating organizations on campus, you know, student movements. And there's a million of those. They, They probably come and go all the time, but he created something called Link, which was Liberty in North Korea. And he ended up growing it to, I think, over 100 chapters on 100 different college campuses throughout the United States into major, major fundraising organization. They were you know, screening documentaries, raising awareness, uh, raising money to support different causes and support people. He built a huge network among congressional staffers. Like he would become on first name basis with the congressional staffers throughout Washington, D.C. to try to get some influence and try and get them looking at bills or funding, you know, or, um, you know, mentioning things on the House floor, that sort of thing. And eventually he moved on from Link. It's a very effective organization, but he wanted to do a lot more than just raise awareness and raise funds. So he started directly helping um, North Koreans who had escaped into China across the border from North Korea into China, he would help them try to make this very, very perilous journey across China to U.S. consulates, whether in Beijing or a couple of other places, kind of undetected. They have to sneak through China, uh, get there, and then apply for asylum in the United States or apply for asylum other places, You know, even go back to or go to South Korea. So he actually started flying to China and to some very, very dangerous places close to the North Korean border. He was meeting these people. He was taking them, like kind of shepherding them in a van you know, across the country undetected and then getting him to the U.S. Embassy to apply for visas. And he ended up getting a lot in a lot of trouble over there as well. He was arrested by Chinese authorities at one point uh, after the U.S. Embassy refused to help or the U.S. consulate refused to help anymore. So he spent about a week in jail in China, uh, along with a couple of the uh, escapees that he had helped before the uh, there was some pressure like congressional pressure to help get him released, but and he made it back to the U.S. So that would have scared off a lot of people, I think. They would have said, all right, that was that was close enough for me. I'm going to find something else to do with my life. But instead, it just kind of re-energized Adrian is what it appears. Yeah. So he went on. He, he made it his mission sort of to find a way to not just, you know, bring about or weaken the 
bring about the downfall over weaken the Kim regime in North Korea, but also kind of create the conditions for the success of the people afterwards. Because we all know we've seen it like in Iraq and other places, you know, you can take down a regime, but what do you replace it with after that? So he very intelligently decided that they had to be there had to be a plan for after that, because, you know, we've learned some hard lessons over the past 20 years or so about what happens when you do that. So he traveled all over the world, making connections, figuring out things like how do you set up cell service networks in a country that doesn't have it and was so censorship heavy? And how do you do other infrastructure projects? You know, they obviously need massive public health assistance and, you know, water purification, just all kinds of things that this burgeoning society would need. So he's making connections all over the world. He goes to Libya during the Arab Spring because the regime is falling at that time. And he's like, I need to see this. I need to see what happens when a regime falls and what kind of structures come up in their place. So he just went by himself as a private citizen, you know, flew over there on his own dime and just kind of observed and made notes and learned and all that. So he's really, I mean, he's just like a, a one-man wrecking crew in a sense. Like he just can't be stopped hardly on his on this quest of his. So a whole lot of things happen that I really can't, you know, get all the way into with the the story, but it's also told in The Rebel in the Kingdom, the book by Bradley Hope that I mentioned, uh, very, very good, and he and I had a great discussion about it. But Adrian eventually comes up with this extremely audacious plan with a group of his supporters where they are going to facilitate the defection of a consular official at the North Korean embassy in Madrid, Spain. North Korea doesn't have many embassies. They do have a few. They have somewhat normal relations with a few countries worldwide, uh, outside of Asia in particular. And he, this official had contacted them anonymously through a website that they set up specifically for this. They kind of broadcast out there, if you're a North Korean, you know, we're willing to talk to you. We will guard your privacy. We will help you in anything that you need. We don't ask anything in return. Just you know, email us here, basically. So this consular official in Madrid apparently contacted him through this website, and they decided that they were going to go and help this guy defect. And the real goal was to try to convince everybody else at this embassy to also defect because there were six other people at the six other North Koreans at this embassy in Madrid. And if they could get all of them to defect as well, because it was, you know, the consular official, he had not told anybody because that's a death sentence to tell anybody about your plan to defect, of course. But if they could get all of them, they could convince them to do it, they could turn potentially turn that consulate in Madrid into the first free North Korean consulate. They could turn it into a brand new emerging government facility. And this is just unbelievable to me, you know, the way that he was going to set up a, like a shadow government also almost, or a, a government exile in Madrid using these guys as the foundation for everything. So in order to hedge their bets and in order to protect this uh, consular official, they had to make it look like he was taken against his will. Because he had family, they have to leave family members back in North Korea whenever they travel overseas as a hostage, and they didn't want this guy's family, you know, the whole bloodline being wiped out as punishment because he chose to defect. So Adrian and his team, they approach the embassy. Um, he is posing as a South Korean businessman who wants to um, invest with the uh, embassy, and they're always looking for cash. It's a very poor country. So they set up a meeting with him, and he goes inside the courtyard. And once they let him in the courtyard, he opens the door and lets the rest of his team in, like five or six other guys come running in. And they all put on ski masks, and they've got uh, like airsoft pistols, and I, I think they had like a crowbar or something like that as well, but non-lethal kind of stuff, but it looks dangerous, certainly. And the intent is to make it look like a forcible kidnapping so that his family is safe back home, and they've kind of hedged their bets just in case things go south. Well, unfortunately for them, that's exactly what happened. Things did go south. Uh, because they were able to round up the other people in the embassy minus one. There were actually seven other people inside, and they only found six of them because the wife of one of the other employees was upstairs, and she heard a commotion downstairs. It was a small building. It's just a converted house in Madrid uh, with a, like a walled courtyard. So she hears this commotion. She thinks that people are being killed downstairs because there's like shouting and and running and all of that. So she jumps out of a second floor window and hurts herself landing in the courtyard and escapes out of a back gate. So they never even realized at first that she was there because nobody would talk to them afterwards. And they kind of, they tie everybody up inside and they talk to the consular official and they're making the plan to get out of there and trying to keep everybody else calm. And meanwhile, this woman has run outside and she's flagging down passerby and flagging down police 
trying to get help, but she doesn't speak Spanish. She only speaks Korean and she can't find anybody that does speak Korean. So there's like chaos and confusion outside because there's this bloody woman stumbling through the streets and people think she's speaking Chinese, but they can't understand her. So eventually I think that they phoned somebody at the Chinese embassy and that person also spoke Korean, if I recall correctly, but eventually they kind of get the story out of her a little bit. So Madrid police go to the embassy like two hours, three hours after all of this began and they're knocking on the door and it's, you know, that's sovereign territory. The police can't just raid an embassy because they got a report of something going on inside. So they're kind of, I don't want to say passive, but they're like, they, there's not much they can do. They can just go check out the situation. So when the police arrive, they're still preparing inside to leave and they haven't successfully convinced anybody else to leave yet. But uh, Adrian realizes that they're in trouble here because police are showing up at the front door and they're not ready to go yet. So he puts a North Korean embassy pin, like a, like a Kim Jong-un pin on his lapel of his suit. And he walks out there and he speaks to the police and he acts as if he is one of the North Korean officials himself because they don't know who works inside or not. And, you know, like I mentioned, he was born in Mexico. He speaks Spanish. So he's able to speak Spanish to these Madrid policemen and act like a real prick and just send them away. He's like, get out of here. This is official business. You have no uh, authority to come in here, you know, beat it. So they don't realize they're talking to the American that has taken over the place. They think that they're talking to one of the officials there because he's played it off so well. And in the meantime, they basically realize that things are falling apart. The consular official himself, he gets cold feet. Eventually he decides he can't actually do this. And he declines to leave with them at this point. He says, I'm sorry, Adrian, you just got to get out of here. This has not worked out like we thought it would. Um, thank you for coming, but you've got to go. So the whole plan has fallen apart now because this woman escaped right at the beginning. Uh, so Adrian and his team, they get together. It, I think night has fallen by this point, and they hop in the consular vehicles. There's like two or three vehicles inside the courtyard there, and they just drive out the gates. And the Madrid police are out there, but they don't really know what to do. They still have no idea what's going on inside, so nobody tries to stop them. And all of them leave except for Adrian. He stays behind by himself. He was kind of the first man in, and he's the last man to leave on this operation that he put together. And he goes out the back gate, I think, just like the woman had, and he hails an Uber and takes the Uber like a very, very long way. I think he takes it all the way out of town and eventually links up at the airport uh, with the guys. But everybody, all the Americans, they make it out of um, Spain successfully, and they get back to the U.S., but – in a way, their problems are really just starting there because this event eventually gets so much attention. So um, huge fallout from this as the media gets hold of this story. A little bit of CCTV footage is released from them outside the gate when they're getting there. And one of the guys whose name is Christopher Ahn, he's a former U.S. Marine, and he was kind of like Adrian's second, I think, on this mission. He's a, a very big, like intimidating looking guy, but he's got like a heart of gold. Um, kind of guy. And he was there because he is such a great facilitator and um, he can calm people down. He's like a great calming presence there, despite being like one of the biggest guys you've seen um, of Korean heritage. So he ends up getting arrested in the U.S. Um, the FBI, or I'm sorry, the marshals, I think they come to his house and they're already inside like searching. He shows up at, no, I'm sorry, that he showed up at um, Adrian's house. They were sure searching in Adrian's house and they arrest him on the spot. And so he's been in pretty serious legal trouble since 2018 when this all went down um, and Spain is working to extradite him right now to face charges for entering the embassy illegally. And they can't find Adrian. Nobody's seen Adrian in like five years at this point, he disappeared. He's got a huge number of contacts. He's an extremely resourceful guy. And once Christopher was arrested, he never came home again. So nobody knows at all where Adrian is, uh, whether he's still in the United States, whether he's, you know, couch surfing or whether he's out in the woods in a cabin somewhere. Nobody knows, but he's still wanted by the U.S. Marshals right now for extradition to Spain to face charges there. Um, North Korean government probably wants to kill these guys. They've been warned by the FBI that the North Koreans might try to kill them after what happened. And, you know, based on that first story we told, if they want to kill you, they can probably get to you, right? Yeah, for sure. So they're they're in you know physical danger. All the guys that were involved in this are in physical danger. A couple of them themselves were North Korean escapees as well, um, some of the members of the team. So Christopher is still fighting a legal battle against extradition right now to this day. Uh, Adrian, whereabouts unknown, just it's a complicated situation, but it really just boggles my mind because the your first thought was, oh, okay, so I guess, you know, CIA put all this together, something like that. You know, you don't just have a group of guys running around on their own, you know, into the embassies of America's adversaries, right? Yeah. But from all the research that Bradley um, Hope has done on all of this, 
it seems like they were kind of aware of him, but nobody could control Adrian at all. He did everything on his own. Um, he self-funded everything. He was just maxing out credit cards and raising a little bit of money here and there to fund all these operations. But he was not acting on their behalf at all because this actually hurt U.S. North Korean relations at the time because if you recall back in 2018 2019 we were having we were pretty close to a breakthrough right there between like um you know President Trump and Kim Jong Un they were kind of like shook hands you know um, Kim Jong Un stepped across the border vice versa the, the Korea, South Korean president did as well so we were close to a breakthrough then and this raid on the embassy really threw a huge wrench in the works of that and things have kind of normalized again in a in a negative sense unfortunately yeah. but quite a debacle quite a story and it's still kind of ongoing now because um you know the guys are actively wanted or they're actively you know fighting extradition of spain to stay in trial and go go to jail there as well so you say so christopher arn is uh at so he's been has he been extradited yet no he hasn't um he is i i don't recall right now if he's still under house arrest at the moment he was under house arrest for quite some time wearing an ankle monitor uh, he hasn't really been able to work. He was like an entrepreneur and an investor before all of this happened. And he's at at the very least, he's grossly underemployed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because it's really hard to find work when you're like, hey, just so you know, the marshals might come pick me up at any time and send me to Spain. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, you know, he was he did not know exactly what the plan was when he signed up for all of this uh, because Adrian kept it all very close to the chest. So he arrived in Spain knowing that they were going to do some sort of um, I don't even know if I would call it an operation, some sort of, you know, event. And he had no idea that they were actually going to be going into the Spanish consul or the North Korean consulate that day until it actually went down. Yeah. So okay. he was caught up in a big way. I mean, he went. He did go, obviously. Yeah. You know, I mean, he's on camera going in and all that, but he was a little bit unaware until it actually went down. And the rest of the team, apart from Adrian, uh, are they kind of whereabouts unknown as well? I don't think so. I think that those guys are facing lesser charges. I would have to look again, honestly, but... Adrian is the only one that I know. I'm sorry. Uh, Christopher is the only one that I know for sure was arrested. Yep. And I'm not certain about the other guys, uh, but okay. Adrian is still on the lam. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. What a, uh, that's a crazy story. And the fact that he's still, especially in today's day and age with technology everywhere, the fact that he's still kind of under the radar, no one knows where he is. That's, that's insane. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I assume that he has some level of support because he knew so many people. Uh, yep. Because he was so well regarded and all that, but you know, whoever's supporting him is also putting themselves at risk because they're quite literally harboring a fugitive from justice. You know, so I'm sure that a lot of his support evaporated. But you know, maybe a core group is still helping him out there, or maybe not. Maybe he's just you know staying on the lam on his own. I really have no idea. Yeah. Um, and yeah. earlier, you know, I mentioned that there was a tie-in to the Kim Jong Nam assassination. Mm -hmm. The tie-in is Christopher Ahn himself. Because Adrian had already been in contact before Kim Jong Nam died, Adrian had been in contact with his son, and wow. Kim Jong Nam's son reached out to Adrian like the day after his father died because he didn't know what to do. The family had been, you know, they'd been living pretty well up until that point in Macau, but suddenly his father's dead, and the family bodyguards, those guys disappeared like they just didn't show up to work the next day, and so he got extremely scared because he's got his mom and his sister there with him. He doesn't know what to do, so he reached out to Adrian. And as it so happened, Christopher was on vacation in the Philippines, just a personal vacation when this happened. So Adrian reached out to him, and when he found out Christopher was in the Philippines, he said, that's great. I need a huge favor. So Christopher ended up flying on his own credit card. He flew into uh, – I guess it was Malaysia. I think it was Malaysia. He flew in, and he met up with Kim jong Nam's family, his son and his wife and daughter. And they filmed like a proof of life video right there at the airport. And then Christopher kind of helped shuttle them onto planes to get them to, I think it was Denmark. Um, Adrian was working the phones. He was working all of his international contacts, and he ended up getting um, asylum granted for them. I think it was in Denmark, um, as long as they could physically make it there like on the flights. So Christopher puts tickets for the Nam family, for the Kim family on his personal credit card, like maxes out a card and puts them on this flight. Uh, to get them out of country so that they can at least survive because they're not really responsible for what, you know, um, their father did or their husband did. Yeah, for sure. Uh, before they fly out, they're waiting for the flights. And according to Christopher, the CIA approached him there at the airport and they said, hey, man, do you do you have any idea what you're doing right now? And, you know, I don't recall exactly his response, but he basically said, I'm doing my best. And so he got the family out of country. They fly into Europe where they've got this asylum request waiting and they they get off the plane, but they never actually make it into customs. So the belief is that CIA was waiting there 
for them, and they shuttled them out a side exit in the airport so they didn't have to go through customs, and they kind of disappeared into whatever the protective custody version of that is for a family of this nature. So they have not been seen either, but nobody thinks that they're in danger right now. They think that they're just being hidden to yeah, protect okay. them. Um, apparently, the son – somebody thinks they spotted him in Washington, D.C., like in a cafe, I yep. think. I have no idea if that's true or not. I have no idea if he came in here. Certainly, they were – if that's what happened, you know, they were debriefed somewhere and they're being protected in, in some sort of fashion, but nobody really knows right now. But Christopher was kind of the linchpin of getting that family out of there, along with Adrian and his international contacts. <laughs> that's uh, so just just an amazing story, really. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I guess, I mean, you could make a full Netflix special about that sort of story and how that connects. Like, that's unreal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've returned to this one in particular, like again and again, because I just can't hardly wrap my head around all of it that happened. And, you know, it's ongoing. I mean, I don't know where this story is going to end up. I don't know if Christopher is going to be extradited to Spain. He might wind up spending many years in jail in Spain. Um, he might be killed. I hate to say it. You know, he could be killed, you know, at some point by the North Koreans if they not necessarily here in the United States. But if he's extradited, I think that's more feasible at least outside of the u.s yeah, um adrian sure. i don't know if one day you know the marshals are going to surround some cabin in the woods somewhere and get him to come out or if he's going to turn himself in one day and kind of face the music uh it's it's really hard to say where this will end up honestly yeah and that's uh i mean that's probably one of the bigger ones on your on your page given the fact that it's still up and <laughs> up in the air still to this day yeah yeah it, it really is um, a lot of these are kind of they're stories where we don't have all the answers but i've kind of you know, settle, settle with the fact that we're not going to have all the answers. But this one, I just feel like anything could happen even now, you know, five years after the events occurred in Madrid. Yeah, for sure. All right. So that, that one was, uh, that one was my choice personally. Um, so the next one is your choice. So I'll read the first paragraph. Uh, excuse me if I get the pronunciation wrong, but uh, Laotian refugees gather around the casket of CIA case officer Jerry Daniels, the only white man to ever receive a traditional three-day long Hmong funeral. Let's go with that. Yeah, that's something else. So that all um, came from an, an interview I did. That it was episode uh, 60, I think, of the podcast. So that is that is last year. It was almost a year ago, I think. Yep. But um, I had the opportunity to speak with a guy uh, named Toby who flew with um, some of the CIA proprietary airlines in Vietnam. Like I, I think he was very briefly with Air America, but mostly he was with a company called Continental Air Services, which was doing the same thing. Uh, but anyway, Toby was an original smoke jumper in the upper Midwest. And if you're not familiar with the smoke jumpers, these are guys that back in the, you know, I think post-World War II period, basically, it's when they started, but, you know, they would parachute into these remote wildfires in the mountains and put them out with axes and that sort of thing. There were no helicopters, uh, you know, fire trucks couldn't make it up into these rural areas with no roads, you know, or a logging trail or something like that. So there was a very, very hardy breed of man who would parachute in and put these fires out practically by hand, or at least control the fires essentially by hand. And that is a very unique skill set, tremendous amount of, you know, self-sufficiency and personal initiative bravery, everything. So these guys, a bunch of them wound up being uh, recruited by the CIA for their early paramilitary operations because they're um, only barely affiliated with the government. They were working like, sometimes they were like part-time National Forest Service employees or something like that. But they were, a lot of them were just like high school kids and locals who were willing to do this for some extra money and just some really, really tough, resourceful guys. So a whole lot of them, I think it was, I want to say it was around 80 or so of these guys over the years were recruited for different, you know, aviation operations, basically, um, in particular in like Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, that region for the most part, but not entirely. So Jerry was one of these guys along with several others. And I, I've spoken to several of them over the past couple of years, but uh, Jerry was a smoke jumper and he went over to work initially in Arizona. He was working with the CIA and they were putting together something that became known as Operation Cold Feet. And Cold Feet was the first use of this um, skyhook recovery system where somebody gets, you know, grabbed by, they're on the ground and they get grabbed by an airplane that's flying overhead. Um, if you've seen that, it was used in one of the Batman movies and it's it's been seen quite a bit. It was in a James Bond film as well, I believe. But Jerry and his friend Toby 
these guys pioneered that. Like they were on the original crew in an old, like a B-29 bomber that was experimenting with this in Arizona so they could put it to use. So they basically figured out how to, you know, grab a guy off the ground with an airplane that was flying 250 miles an hour above and do so successfully without injuring or killing the guy. You would hate to be the first person to test that, <laughs> wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you really would. So, you know, they used dummies, eventually like straw dummies that weighed 200 pounds or something like that. I think that they they did a pig was their first live subject. Uh, they yanked a pig off the ground. And the pig was very upset afterwards, <laughs> as you can imagine, but it did survive at least. And I forget somewhere is the name of the very first guy who got picked up the first live candidate. And there's some videos of the, the training sequences and all that. And it looks incredibly dangerous. Like it looks like it would break your back, honestly. But, um, you know, it, it was a viable means of exfiltration. You couldn't put a guy down that way, but you could pick him up in a way that you, you couldn't land an airplane. So eventually they used this in the Arctic because they find a Soviet research station out in the Arctic and it's on like the ice flow where um, it's all broken up, you know, like the, the ice is melting. And so this research station is just some, you know, tents and some huts and some, you know, wooden boxes, that kind of thing is all that's left. It's abandoned and it's literally floating out there. Like every day it's in a different position because it's floating in the ice flow. So they locate this thing and they decide to drop a couple of guys there and see what they can find, any um, valuable intelligence that was left behind. So they've got, uh, it was a, like an Air Force guy and one other guy, I forget, he was a civilian volunteer like a um a doctor a research scientist i think so they flew up there it was incredibly difficult to find this research station again because every day it's in a different position and you're flying without hardly any landmarks because it's just ice everywhere you look but they found it uh, these guys parachuted down and they spent two days at this research station and they gathered up all kinds of papers they took a ton of photos they you know filled up like a duffel bag full of some scientific equipment that sort of thing and then the b-29 bomber it it came back and it picked them up again and it yanked these guys off the ice at like 200 miles an hour, something like that. And one of the guys, he was dragged along the ice for like a couple of hundred feet because it didn't quite yank him off. It, it just yanked him horizontally. So he's very lucky he didn't die from that. But they picked up these guys. They picked up all the stuff that they had found successfully. So there's photos of them inside the aircraft, the fuselage. And uh, Jerry Lee Daniels was there. He was inside. Uh, Toby, my guest, was there, Jerry's best friend. They were both in the aircraft when all this happened. It's one of the most legendary operations of the cold war honestly and they were both there and they've got photos of these guys like drinking whiskey to warm up inside the airplane after they've been picked up from two days in the arctic so after that these guys they go to southeast asia because things are heating up there and jerry is an extremely personable guy and he ends up working very very closely with the uh the Hmong. like you mentioned that's like an indigenous tribe in like laos cambodia south vietnam they're kind of spread all over that area well, Jerry just – he takes a huge, huge liking to these people, and he learns their language on his own. He starts um, eating with them all the time. He eats their food, and he sleeps in their you know, their tents or their huts or their barracks or whatever have you, and he just totally immerses himself. And they love him right back too because nobody else has ever gone to these links to get to know them. And so it's such a powerful relationship. In fact, Toby told me that um, Jerry became very close with a guy named Bang Pao. And Bang Pao is the most famous uh, Laotian of the war, probably, because he was kind of the leader of our indigenous paramilitary forces on the ground there. Um, a very, very infamous guy who lived out his life in the U.S. He was extremely brutal guy, but extremely effective guy as well. And apparently he told Jerry that Jerry was his favorite because he was the only white man who had never lied to him. So Jerry built this relationship that nobody else could have built over a period of years working there. So eventually um, he becomes... Vang Pao's case officer, and he had just started as a paramilitary guy, as a smoke jumper, but because of this relationship, which is the most important part of that type of job, um, he's a full-on case officer at this point, and he is kind of uh, the go-to man for Vang Pao. So years and years go by, and we all know the Vietnam War ultimately did not you know, work out for the U.S. We eventually pulled out of there, and South Vietnam fell. Jerry was there for, for most of that, and he was extremely effective, but you, know, you need more than that to, to win a war. Obviously, so things don't go well, and the the Hmong after 1975, they become targets, both in South Vietnam or now it's not South Vietnam anymore; it's just Vietnam. And in Laos, you know, there's a new government in Laos, um, which is a communist government, and so all the people, all the paramilitaries that were fighting with the Americans, they have you know targets on their back. So by this time, Jerry winds up working in the U.S. embassy in Thailand, and he's 
you know, got like an official cover there as a State Department employee or something like that. So he spends the next few years helping get all of these former paramilitaries and their families out of the region. And Jerry, because he knows them so well and because he knows the language and culture and all that, he can also sort out all the ones who were not a part of that and who were just trying to take advantage and come to the U.S., even if they were uh, you know, communist sympathizers or something like that. So he's able to sit down with thousands upon thousands of people and discern who was the real deal and who was not and who's just you know lying about things to try to get to the U.S. So I think something like 50,000 uh, of these Hmong eventually come to the U.S. primarily based on Jerry's work in Thailand over the next like seven years or so. And a lot of them wind up settling in a couple of different places. They settle in like the San Francisco Bay Area, but a lot of them in Montana. And that's where Jerry and a lot of the other smoke jumpers were from. So you can go to areas of Montana to this day, and there's huge Laos uh, or Hmong subculture there. And it's all, all not entirely, but a lot of that is because of Jerry's work at that time. That you know, generations and generations have lived there now. So he's there working. He's very, very effective. He's one of our our, our man in Southeast Asia in a way, and uh, everything's working out in you know as best they can under the circumstances. Well, one day in 1982, this is like 20 something years after Jerry joined CIA and, and went to that region in the first place. Uh, he doesn't show up to work at the embassy. So he doesn't show up for three days in a row. And finally, somebody goes to his apartment and inside they find Jerry dead on the floor in his apartment. And he's already severely decomposing. Apparently, he was unrecognizable just after three days because, you know, it's probably 90 degrees in the apartment. It's been, you know, it's very, very hot. Uh, air conditioning is not working. It's really done a number on him already. So he's basically unrecognizable. So ultimately, the story is that there was like a um, a gas leak from the water heater and the room filled up with carbon monoxide and he suffocated in there. Well, Toby, his best friend for his whole life, Toby does not believe that at all. And it's such a bizarre way for somebody to die after the career that he's had. Because, you know, if he had died in a helicopter crash or something, that happened to a lot of guys back there. If he had been shot in the back in an alley, you know, that a lot more feasible. But, you know, such a bizarre and unexplained accidental kind of death, you know, like that does not sit right with Toby or a lot of other people. So his body is shipped back to the U.S. in a sealed coffin, and it's not opened up before his funeral. Shipped back to Montana. And by this time, you know, this is seven years after the war ended or seven years after um, Vietnam was unified. There are, like I said, tens of thousands of Hmong and other Laotians in that region. So when Jerry comes back, they all know who he is. He's a rock star to them. He saved all their lives. So they have a funeral for him along with his family. And I've, I've posted some pictures of it before, but it's the only traditional three-day-long Hmong funeral that's ever been given to a white man. Uh, as to this day, as far as I know, I've tried to research a little bit more since then. And this happened in 1982. And, you know, that was what, 41 years ago. I don't think there's been another one since then either. But Jerry is buried. They have a, you know, three days of singing and celebrating and eating before they, you know, uh, finally bury the coffin. And for many, many years after that, because they didn't open up the coffin, a lot of the Hmong, they're kind of a superstitious people, you know, from what um, Toby's told me, they did not believe that Jerry was in there. They wanted to open that coffin and see for themselves because they didn't think he was in there. And there were rumors among that entire community for decades, for decades, that he was seen elsewhere. People would go to Paris on vacation with their kids 15 years later, and they would say, I thought I saw Jerry in the crowd, you know, that kind of thing. And those rumors would like spread like wildfire among the community. And they also have a tradition. I don't think it just applies to him. It applies to a lot of people. But uh, in Jerry's honor, every time they would have a big gathering, their uh, big meal together, they would leave a plate of food and an empty chair for Jerry at the gatherings uh, because they were hoping that he would show up again and partake. And of course he never did. So uh, Jerry kind of lived on in the memory of all of these people that he saved. So his coffin was finally disinterred just a year or two ago, uh, about 40 years after he died. And they opened it up and it, according to Toby, it was him, like DNA did confirm that it was him, and he did not have any, you know, like he didn't have any bullet wounds, knife wounds, any obvious trauma, anything like that to the body. But beyond that, they could not really ascertain any other um, cause of death. So it could have been like the, the carbon monoxide in the room. 
it could have been some sort of you know poison injected something like that i mean this is you know this is me being kind of schizo with this kind of thing but it's not outside the realm of possibility you know what i mean yeah so jerry had also talked about like a very mysterious man who had approached him at one point and kind of threatened him and he didn't know much what to make of it i don't remember all the details i think they just called him like the man in the gray hat or something like that who had approached him and kind of intimated that you know he had a target on his back but uh you know, it's another story. I don't think we'll have a, a satisfactory conclusion to that one of what really happened to him. It could have just been a, a very sad and bizarre incident, you know, that kind of cut down a man in the prime of his life. Uh, or it could have been something else because he was a very, very influential and important person uh, for many, many years in that region. Yeah, yeah. And that that's a, uh, if you, I don't know if anybody noticed, but people that have listened to this show before, know that I love to talk and can sometimes go off on a ramble. And that one, I was speechless the entire time because the fact that he was able to run, obviously, uh, sources or agents or whatever you guys want to call them, um, and then screen thousands of people and the people that made it into the US were through his ability to screen these people and just shows how effective he was at his job and how good he was at what he did. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that, you know, I hate to speculate, but I think things would have turned out a lot different if we had a lot more guys like Jerry, you know, in that region at that time because nobody was as good at what he did as he was. It yeah, doesn't appear. For sure. And like, so, I mean, like you said at the very start, the the smoke jumpers and what they did just shows the sort of person he was. And then, you know, the rest, as you go further through the story, you re- like to be out there by yourself doing that job. And then once you have a target on your back to continue doing that job, regardless of what's, the threat towards you i mean just show and there was there's so many guys that were around in that time that were doing that job exactly like him yep yep but there, he was irreplaceable no doubt about it yeah for sure all right cool so last one uh and this was one of my choices uh so first paragraph cia case officer uh paul stombauer i think is that how you pronounce his name I think so. I haven't heard it out loud, honestly. I think Stombaugh, maybe. I'm not sure. Stombaugh um, is arrested on the streets of Moscow by the KGB while attempting to meet with a Soviet source. So let's go with that. Yeah, th- this is another amazing story. And in this case, you know, I mentioned earlier how hard it is to find video or still photos or something like that. But this is one case where they exist because there is footage of Paul being arrested on the streets of Moscow uh, on his way or waiting to begin a meeting with a source. Very, very dramatic footage. The The Russians, they filmed it themselves, and it showed up in a documentary a number of years later. So uh, Paul was originally there, – there's really not a whole lot of info out there about this guy. I've tried to look into him quite a bit, and there's just not – there's a few blurbs here and there, but that's it. But uh, Paul was an FBI agent to begin with in his career, and he made the decision that – you know that, that's pretty active part of the Cold War right there in the you know 1970s being an FBI agent – but he decided he wanted to do even more. He wanted to go kind of meet the enemy on their territory. So he switched over to the CIA and he became a case officer himself. So being assigned to Moscow, you know, that requires a, a very specific kind of person and they have to go undergo a tremendous amount of training. So really sent just the, the very, very best that they could to a location like this. And I had the opportunity to interview one of Paul's close associates, a guy named Michael Sellers, uh, very early on in my podcast. It was episode number three. And he's written a book about his time in Moscow along with Paul, uh, but it hasn't been published yet. So I'm still waiting for that book to come out, but he's been working on it for quite some time. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, It's called Year of the Spy by Michael Sellers. Not out yet, unfortunately, but uh, Paul was there and Paul was handling a guy who we uh, has been called since then. He's been called the billion dollar spy. His name was Adolf Tokachev, and he was far and away one of the most valuable sources of information for American intelligence in Russia during the Cold War. And uh, he was an engineer working at a research facility in Moscow. And his wife's family back in the 1930s, a lot of them had been killed during the Stalinist purges. So he basically, her whole, whole side of the family had been wiped out. So he was very, very aware of the excesses of the Soviet government because he had seen it happen to you know his wife's family. And he realized that this was not a government that he wanted to support. He wanted to see something else, something better for the people of Russia. He was you know, a patriotic Russian, but not a patriotic Soviet by any means. 
So this guy, Tolkachev, he ended up on his own. He tried to reach out to Americans at the embassy, which is incredibly dangerous stuff. And he did so by dropping a handwritten note through the window of an American vehicle at a gas station near the embassy because he knew that Americans use this certain gas station all the time. So he thought that would be a good way, a low-profile way to get a message to the Americans. Well, as luck would have it, he didn't know that this was going to happen, but the window – the person who owned the car that he dropped the note through was actually the CIA station chief who was you know, under official cover there. He wasn't supposed to be known, but he, of all people, gets this note through his window, and he thinks that it's a dangle. You know, He thinks that they're laying a trap for him, so he doesn't respond to it because it's too good to be true. So Tolkachev waits for a call, you know, waits for a signal, and never comes, so he tries it again. And I think he goes back a third time even because they are, they're putting him off because they, they don't think he can possibly be real. They think it's got to be a trap. But eventually he provides enough detail, including some like classified notes in his message to kind of prove that he's the real deal. And they say to themselves, there's no way the Soviets would give this away just as a dangle, just as bait. You know, this is too good to be true, honestly, or it's too good not to be true is what I mean. So they decide to meet up with him. So they, you know, they have some covert signals that go back and forth and they eventually establish a meeting with this guy. They meet him on the street and they do kind of like a walking meeting with him, I think. And he turns over a bunch of paper documents at that time, and it's everything that they could hope for, that he's giving all kinds of tremendously valuable insight into Soviet military research and development. You know, they're working on stealth. They're working on, like, new generation radar back in the 1970s. You know, very, very important um, stuff, and he's got access to it all, and he's willing to give it all. So they end up meeting with him a bunch of times. I want to say, like, 26 times maybe over a period of eight years. They meet with this guy, Tolkachev. Uh, they give him little disguised cameras, you know, the micro cameras, and he'll take a whole bunch of footage while he's in his office. He'll take photo after photo after photo of all these documents, and he'll, you know, bring them back a whole bunch of rolls of film. They'll give him some new stuff and just tremendously valuable stuff, which is why they called him the billion dollar spy. And it was actually a lot more than a billion dollars that he provided in value to the US. Well, eventually, um, he is betrayed by two of the most famous spies in American history. That's Aldrich Ames and Robert Hansen. Uh, both those guys give up enough information separately to identify him, uh, as well as another guy who was supposed to go to Moscow, but he failed out of the training. There was another agent who was going to go there, and he ends up – after he leaves the CIA, he defected to the um, Soviet Union. <clears throat> so they have enough tidbits from all of these guys to identify Tolkachev. And because they've identified Tolkachev, they arrest him on the street. So there's some footage of his arrest as well. And then they go after his contact. So they don't know exactly who from the embassy is going to meet him, but they do know when and where the meeting is going to happen. So they set up cameras. They set up a, you know, an arrest team there, and that's where this footage comes from, so Paul. So Paul went to a huge amount of trouble to disguise his intentions, to disguise his route, uh, to watch for surveillance, you know, to wait for a lull in activity, all of that. Just tremendous amount of planning went into this meeting just like it did every single time. But ultimately, it's for nothing because they didn't have to follow him to the meeting. They didn't have to watch him for weeks in advance because they already knew from Tolkachev when and where the meeting was going to take place. So there was no surveillance on him. He didn't miss anything because they were already there in place waiting for him. So there's footage of Paul. He is walking on the street. He's got like a, a big plastic bag, like a big plastic shopping bag in one hand and a cardboard box in another hand like he picked up a delivery or something like that. And he's waiting near a phone booth on the street in Moscow, which is where he's supposed to wait for the meeting with Tolkachev. And he looks one way, and the KGB guys, they rush him from the other side. So he just looks away, and they come up behind him, and they grab him immediately. You know, They put him in like a headlock kind of thing, and um, three or four different guys swarm him, and they kind of drag him away really quickly. And because they already had Tolkachev, they had even waited, and um, they'd found a body double for Tolkachev because they didn't want – Paul or anybody else to know that they had already arrested Tolkachev. They wanted them in the dark on that. So they set up this little ruse where it appeared from a distance that Tolkachev was also being arrested, like halfway down the block, uh, just in case Paul reported, saw that and reported it later on. Nobody would know that he'd already been under arrest for you know several weeks at that point. So Paul is taken, and because he's got diplomatic status, he's not held for very long, just I, I think a day maybe not very long at all and that normally is what happens you know it's very embarrassing but there's no real harm that comes to the american case officer in this case but you know what happens to the russians in these cases is much worse <laughs> excuse me so um paul is released pretty quickly he is you know declared persona non grata and he has to leave the country really quickly 
and Tolkachev is held for about a year after his arrest, and he's you know interrogated very, very, very harshly, of course, and he is put on trial after a year. Uh, the trial only is one day long, and he's found guilty, and he's executed either that night or the next day, I think. Um, very, very quick turnaround. And, you know, it kind of sounds like a show trial, but it, it certainly is true that he was doing, he was committing espionage. You know, he was certainly doing everything that he was accused of, but, you know, a one day trial followed by an immediate execution is, seems pretty harsh by our Western standards, certainly. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we lost our greatest asset in the U.S. because of some of our worst traders here in the U.S. Yeah. And I'm so, sure like we could fill another podcast episode um, talking about those sorts of cases and maybe that'll happen in the future. But um, mm -hmm. that, yeah, that sort of period of, uh, of the cold war and in regards to espionage, I mean, you could talk for days and days and days on the sort of stories that came out of that time. Yeah. It, it just keeps drawing me back in. You know what I mean? It's really hard to look away from this stuff and I've been doing it for quite some time now and I'm not any less interested. I'm not, you know, tired of it or anything like that by any means because it's just continually astonishing the the levels of treachery and the levels of bravery and the levels of ingenuity that in, are involved in all of this you know and how so many things change and yet so many things stay the same as well yeah for sure and you know you you think that we're heading to a part where like you look at the cold war and think oh no those tactics and the way that they do things are done but then you look at things like the ukraine and they're fighting in trenches all over again and it's 2023 so oh yeah um, i mean who knows who knows where this sort of world's heading to and it's uh i think your page is almost definitely or i would say definitely the premier's kind of um account to be able to figure out what used to happen in the past and potentially what's happening right now as well yeah i appreciate that i i certainly think that history is cyclical you know and there's a tremendous amount we can learn from years past and apply now and, and see it all happening all over again and uh, it's a lot of fun for me. It's very rewarding as well. And I hope that I've opened my people's eyes to, you know, things that have happened and things that are happening and things that will happen as well. Yeah, for sure. All right, cool. So Justin, just to uh, finish off, I did want to, I told you offline, I wanted to have a quick chat about kind of your store. And um, you said that you didn't want to do a publicity piece and that's not what this is, but I think there is a lot of value in the stuff that you're selling um, and in line with this podcast and kind of the theme that we try and stay on is, preparing for you know your worst situation um or bad situations that can find us day to day and uh so i've gone through your store and some of your items that you sell are incredibly kind of valuable um do you want to talk a little bit about your store and kind of where you find the motivation for the items that you kind of release sure sure so i i started out selling some stuff just like you know t-shirts and that kind of thing and really the whole goal of the store was just to fund my book collection in a sense and, you know, kind of compensate for the amount of time that I put into this because all of the content that I put out there is totally free, right? It's all on Instagram. It's all on the podcast or YouTube or whatever have you. And it, it takes a tremendous amount of time, right? So I'm trying to kind of make that time back up. But I, I moved away from a lot of the simple, you know, gifts and novelties and all that. And I found some really, really good stuff. And I'm always on the search for more. So I move way more into like personal security and data security, you know, info security kind of stuff as well, because there really are threats all around us all the time. We're all pretty well aware of physical threats and that kind of thing. And we also are pretty well aware, I think, of non-permissive environments, right? So there are plenty of places that you cannot carry a knife, you know, a folding knife that's longer than two inches. Plenty of places where you can't walk in there with that without, you know, getting hassled about it one way or the other. But those same places, you can absolutely walk in with a big pin in your shirt, you know, or something that looks like a big pen. And, you know, that might be the thing that keeps you alive in the end. So those are the kind of products that I look for. I think that they all have a great tie into the kind of stories that I tell the mindset of the people that are involved in these stories. And they also provide some real utility to the people. So I've got like a, I call it the G10 hole puncher. You know, it's a, it looks like a big pen on the outside, but it's solid G10, um, carbon all the way through. And it's very, very good for, punching holes and stuff. And it's something that I have on me at all times. Um, I also have some other stuff. I've got some of the coin knives, you know, the ones that have the hidden blade on the inside and it can't be, you know, it's an inch long and they're, I use them more for utility than anything else, but you could use it, you know, if you need to, if you need to cut some restraints or something like that, but they're also great just to drop in your pocket with your coins, your actual coins. 
and you're not going to have any problems if you're putting that in a tray for a metal detector, you know, but you can still cut open boxes and that sort of thing if you need to, because these are, you know, these blades are like a half an inch long or three quarters of an inch long, something like that. Yeah, for and, sure. Uh, and I, I've got I'm a pretty just, good selection of, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I was just going to say, I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at your store right now and um, we've got things like a hollow lighter dead drop kit. Um, but then things like this chapstick, it's, an E and E escape and evasion kit where you've got what do you what do you have in the escape and evasion kit in the chapstick? Yeah, I've got I've got a couple of different models of that. One of them is called the Chap Pick, and the other one is called the El Chapo. You know, after the the yep. uh, famous Mexican drug lord. But one of them, the El Chapo itself, has uh, what appears to be the actual wax lip wax underneath it. So you can pop the top on that, and it looks exactly like chapstick, right? And um, that reduces the amount of space that you have in the hollow cavity, but it's got a glow stick. It's got some rubber bands. It's got some um, cable in there that you can use to cut ties if you need to, the serrated cable. And it's got a, um, what's the other thing? It's got a level in there, I think, and um, a handcuff key in there as well. So the chap pick as well is very similar, but if you take the top off of it, you can see the contents in that one. Uh, so you can fit a little bit more. You've got an entire lock pick kit in there but if you're so concerned about a personal search that you don't want anybody to pop the cap on your chapstick then you might want to go with the el chapo and yeah. it's a little bit more of a it's a more reduced kit but it's a more really realistic kit for passing through a, a personal search or something like that yeah for sure and uh one thing i'm a huge advocate for is this uh i guess it's like a wrist strap and it's got the tungsten bead on it yeah um, yeah 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 i i've got one myself um do you want to just talk a little bit about that and then a little bit about your hidden handcuff keys, because I've seen them that kind of clip onto the tongue of your shoe and all that sort of thing. Sure, sure. Yep, so um, that wrist strap that you're talking about, the GTFO wrist strap is very popular. Uh, I'm not the only one that carries it, but it's a huge seller for me, honestly. And it's the simplest thing in the world. And it's so great because you put it on and you just forget about it immediately. But it's a uh, elastic strap, uh, it goes on your wrist. You can put it on with several other bead bracelets if you want, and it'll just disappear right in with all the others. Uh, but it's got a, a tungsten carbide bead on it that you can use if you need to. There's a very, very easy technique for breaking a window. You know, if you've been locked inside of a vehicle or if you need to break into a vehicle or something like that, you've got this as an escape or as an entry tool if you need to. Uh, you know, I definitely encourage you to practice with it before you actually need it because you don't want to try and figure out how it works when you actually need it, you know, at the most dangerous moment of your life, potentially. Uh, and it also comes with a handcuff key that clips right onto it as well. So you can pull that handcuff key off just by stretching the nylon a little bit, stretching the elastic a little bit so it's thinner, and then you can pop the key right off and use it. Uh, once again, that's the kind of thing that it's great to buy it, and it's great to have it, but it's better to buy it, have it, and practice with it before you actually need it, yeah, right? Because sure. if you think to yourself, oh, just because I have something, it'll automatically save me, that's not the case. So a lot of the stuff that I sell, you know, I encourage you to actually put it to use a few times to make sure that you know how to use it before you need it in the dark you know, why you're scared, why your heart's pumping, that sort of thing. Yeah, for sure. But, and then the hidden handcuff key um, as well, because I'm wanting to buy one of these as well, just because you never know if something does happen, you know, you don't want to, you'd rather have it and not need it. And this is 20 bucks on your store. Um, what was the kind of, I guess, the motivation and where did the thought process come from, from developing one that can kind of fit easily onto your shoe without being detected? Yeah, I was I was lucky that this was already in production. I found a company that was making these and they're great because they're they're really tiny. So I sell the I sell a four pack of these and they have a little tiny pocket clip on them. So you can put them. I've got videos of them in various places, but you can attach them to a belt loop on the inside. You can put them in the waist of your pants. You can put them. I've got them on the um, the rear strap on my hiking shoes. Uh, they can stay right there and they just disappear. Like nobody's looking for these. They're made of plastic, so they're not going to show up on a metal detector. You know, even a very thorough personal search is probably not going to find these because they're so tiny. They weigh like a gram, you know, and it will potentially save your life. You know, I see these, <clears throat> you know, I've got stories of guys getting um, kidnapped and illegally detained or held hostage all over the world. And, you know, you don't want to be in that kind of situation. So I call a lot of this stuff my my travel secure kit. Because a lot of people, you know, aren't just living all over the world, but they travel all over the world as well. And the world can be a pretty chaotic place. So I want to give people kind of the tools to travel a little bit more confidently. Things that are, you know, they're legal to carry. They disappear easily. They're hard to find, especially if you're dealing with, you know, another country's heavy handed government or something like that that you're really worried about. 
Uh, it can truly be the difference between life and death if you practice with it and if you start carrying it on a daily basis. But yeah, these these keys, four of them, you know, you can put them on two pairs of shoes and two pairs of pants and just forget about them and they'll still be there a year from now, you yeah. know, when you need them. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, sweet. Thanks, Justin. I really appreciate you coming on, man. I know you're a, a busy guy with all the stuff that you've got going on. And obviously, you've got a massive following on your page and people would really benefit from just educating themselves about history um, as well as learning a little bit about kind of where, how the world has gotten to the place that it has. Um, it generally has to do with, you know, guys like Jerry um, and these guys that have kind of done things in the shadows um, without kind of getting any recognition. So I just want to say thank you very yep. much for coming on the show. Well, hey, I appreciate the time, man. Thank you so much. So if you guys want to go and follow Justin, if you don't already, um, Spycraft101 uh, on Instagram, it'll be linked in the show notes. So thank you very much, Justin. Again, I really appreciate you coming on, man. Absolutely, Ben. Take care. Thank you. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101. You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone. If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening.